Okay, uh, again, welcome to our program, and I'm going to turn it over to Sheila Sieber to talk very briefly about the Jews for a Secular Democracy initiative of the Society for Humanistic Judaism and our Illinois chapter, and then we'll get our uh, featured speaker. Well, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, we, we did have a couple of people register who haven't show, shown up, but we will be recording this, so they will be able to get the link after, the, after this has been recorded. Um, I am the chair of Jews for Secular Democracy, as well as its Illinois chapter. Um, it's the, the initiative, uh, which is an initiative of the Society for Humanistic Judaism, but it is a pluralistic initiative um, to encourage and to assist the wide variety of uh, Jews to defend the separation of church and state as it has been constitutionally constructed. Um, the idea is we, we are not anti-religion, but we do not believe that it belongs in public policy. And so the tagline is religion out of government. Uh, and as, as Jews, we believe we, were, we are uniquely positioned to be able to defend the separation of church and state in government because we have been the victims when that has not been true and we have benefited from a secular state. Um, if anyone wants any more information, we do have a Facebook page and a website. It's jfasd.org. Um, the, the national organization does also uh, present a number of webinars. There are several that are, have been recorded and are available on the Jews for Secular Democracy YouTube channel. And they have had speakers on a wide variety of topics because many of the issues that we have grappled with certainly over the last four years and at the state level continue to grapple with have their basis in the fact that there is one particular uh, religious denomination that is pushing to break down the wall that separates public policy from anyone's religion. And they are pretty well organized about uh, pushing their particular religious point of view in a number of areas of public policy. And the national organization has put together a number of webinars on many of these topics. Um, I just want to <laughs> make one plug. Um, Tenth Dems is going to be putting together, I believe in March, I will be sending out the date uh, end of this month on um, the, <laughs> the push for um, limiting women's reproductive rights in the state of Illinois. And it's going to be given by the new Speaker of the House, Chris Welch. And I will be sending information and registration on that to all, the, all of the supporters in Illinois of this particular initiative. April 19th. April 19th. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Lori. Um, so just because uh, we live in a fairly blue state we are, where we are not confronted with these issues at the legislative level on a number of topics, that doesn't mean they don't rear their heads every once in a while. And we certainly need to keep on top of what is going on in our own state. And with that little plug, I want to thank Rabbi Shalom, who has been a huge supporter of, of uh, the organization of the Illinois chapter and Cole Hadash, who is both sponsoring the technology for this, and to Rabbi Adam, who has um, gotten us a wonderful speaker for today. And we're going to be talking about citizen science and scientific literacy. And I will turn it over to Rabbi Shalom to introduce him. Great. Well, and I'm going to keep the introduction brief um, because Matt is not a shy person. So he's <laughs> able to talk about himself if he needs to. Um, I actually first met Matt through his work with Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, which at the time had a Northern Illinois chapter. Um, and I was always impressed with his energy, his enthusiasm, and his commitment to uh, the need to separate religion and government and uh, how that was good for everybody, not just for secular people. Um, he has been an educator for the last 20 plus years at both the high school and college levels, uh, teaching mathematics, astronomy, and uh, physics. Um, and uh, so he has quite uh, a lot of expertise on the importance of scientific literacy for good citizenship because he's been training citizens to be scientifically literate for 20 plus years 
um, at multiple levels. And so without any further ado, I want to hand it over to Matt um, and let him take it away with his discussion of citizen science. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Adam. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, it's uh, good to uh, see everybody, uh, virtually speaking, of course. Uh, let me go on and uh, share my screen here so that we can uh, all see the presentation as I go through it. Uh, and let me just say, uh, first of all, everybody can see it, okay? You good? All right, awesome. Uh, let me just say that uh, at any point as we go through this, if you have a question, uh, feel free to unmute and ask. I'll also provide some time for questions at the end. And, uh, and uh, you know, so uh, there we go. All right, so um, here's the obligatory opening slide. I figured this is kind of a cool graphic, you know, stick up for science, right? And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to focus uh, today on talking about uh, I'll be talking about my own experiences as, uh, as Rabbi Adam mentioned a few moments ago, and I'll be, I'll be providing some uh, anecdotes uh, from my years as a teacher, as uh, an advocate for science, uh, and, and also uh, in, through my political involvement as well. Um, some of you may know that I'm, I'm, I'm also very politically involved here in the North Shore area. Um, and what I, what I really want to do at, by the end of this talk is I want to be able to, by drawing upon my own experiences, provide all of you uh, some hints and kind of like a roadmap for how you can be good advocates for science, especially when you're talking to people whom you would consider to be uh, anti-scientific. Okay. Uh, that's that's actually a large focus of this uh, of this talk because it's been my experience that it's a, a lot of people have difficulty bridging that communication gap and so that's going to be a big part of what I'm going to talk about tonight or today rather. Uh, okay, let me see if I can. Uh, there we go. Okay, here's the first thing that I want to really emphasize: um, scientific and critical thinking uh, is not natural. It just isn't. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot. We talk about the importance of thinking scientifically. We talk about the importance of you know, critical thinking and, 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 and all of these things, but it's really not something that comes to people naturally. Um, in fact, people who are very, are very able to actively engage critical thinking in almost every aspect of their lives are, are by far the exception, not the rule. Uh, and this applies to every single one of us, especially when it comes to really deeply held personal beliefs that connect up to our identities, such as religion, politics, and so on. And this is something that I'll emphasize in a few moments. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, and, and I think the first step in being able to be a good citizen scientist, so to speak, like, as I like to say, uh, the first step in being able to uh, help communicate science to people and, and bridge this gap is to admit about ourselves uh, that uh, even though we may be science boosters, we're not necessarily always the best about thinking critically in our own lives, in our own processes. Um, and this is a perfectly normal thing. It's just the way that we're wired. Uh, we, are, we are wired to be this way. And so the point that I want to make with this is if this is true of ourselves, and I, I know 100% this is true for me, <laughs> um, then why would we expect people with whom we disagree on a variety of topics, so pseudoscientists, believers in conspiracy theories, uh, and so on, why would we expect them to be able to just kind of automatically kick into a, what we would call a critical thinking mode? Uh, if we have problems with it, then obviously other people have problems with it too. And so that's kind of the crux of the problem. Uh, and it's also tied up to something that I referenced a few moments ago, uh, identity, uh, worldview, right? We all have an identity. We all have a worldview from which we approach things. Uh, for example, me, I consider myself uh, a, a science-minded person, uh, a secular person, uh, and a, a husband, 
um, you know, a friend, a lover, right? All of these things. Uh, some people identify uh, much of their worldview around nationalistic ideas. You know, I'm an American, right? Or I, or maybe they uh, they they form part of their core identity based upon uh, ethnicity or religion, right? I'm Christian. I'm Jewish. I'm Muslim. Uh, I'm Buddhist. I'm atheist. Whatever. Um, Many of us, uh, I would say most of us at some level, a big core of our identity is formed around our familial relationships and our friendships, or, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a sister, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, um, and, and, and these extended family relationships. And then there are also, especially in today's day and age, a lot of us who form our worldview around our political beliefs. I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Green, I'm a Libertarian, uh, I'm an anarchist, you know, whatever. Uh, and so I think one of the critical things to understand is if you're talking to people who share your identity and worldview, the communication is much easier. Uh, and, and so here, this communication I'm having with you all is, is much easier because, you know, we all kind of, sh we all are here uh, as science boosters, we all kind of share this uh, this uh, pro science worldview. Uh, I, I, I would guess that most of the people here are somewhat, myself included, somewhat left of center in our politics, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so we have these things in common. So communication between and among us is probably not so hard. But what do you do if you have to communicate? especially on these scientifically related topics to somebody who doesn't necessarily share so much of your identity or worldview, whether it's face-to-face -face communication or you know, maybe it's um, you know, online as most things are right now, uh, how do we do that? And so this is the key, key question, communication. And it's at this point, you know, things, I'm, I'm kind of making the talk a little heavy, so I, I like to lighten it up. With a, with a silly little graphic every now and then, <laughs> okay. Uh, and because if you cannot communicate effectively, especially on an important topic, as the silly graphic shows, sometimes bad things can happen, okay. Uh, or another way I like to put this, and this is again, something I think that uh, most, if not all of us can relate to, how do you talk to your quote, crazy uncle? <laughs> okay, uh, we, we've all uh, either had the experience or, uh, we have uh, heard about somebody who has had the experience, maybe a relative or a friend or whatever, you know, they, they, they go home for the holidays or they uh, are, are at some kind of family gathering or, or they get together with friends and there's this guy there. Uh, and uh, I have to, you know, kind of give a little shout out to Nicholas Cage. Uh, he gets a lot of, he gets a lot of uh, crap for being kind of the crazy uncle, but he does it so well. Uh, so I always like to kind of show this picture, but the question is, how do you talk to somebody like this? How can you communicate with them? Now, of course, there are different there are different uh, levels here. I mean, we we have people with whom we disagree in minor ways. There are people who uh, are you know just completely out in you know out in the cornfields and how they they're thinking, and then there's everything in between. Um, but we've all at some point, I'm certain, had one of what I call, quote, those conversations where we just can't understand where this other person is coming from. And they apparently can't understand where we're coming from. The communication completely breaks down. And you just want to, if you're in person, you, you just have this overwhelming urge to want to smack them. Uh, or uh, if you're having a discussion online, the unfriend button is just begging to be pushed. Right, and I see some people smiling here uh, because I can, and, and that tells me that we've all had this experience. Um, and I have had these temptations as well. What I will tell you is in my, I have something like uh, over 1700 Facebook friends. Uh, that's my social media platform of choice. And in the 12 years I've been on there, I've actually only unfriended two people. And it's, it's something that I really work hard to not do, even though there are times you're just like, Whoa, <laughs> you just want to do it so bad. 
And I want to, and, and later in the talk, I'll try to explain why I try to avoid doing that. Um, it's tempting, but uh, in some in some cases, not all. So I don't I don't want to speak universally here, but in some cases, I think it's the absolute worst thing that can be done. Uh, and I'll explain why I think about that uh, in a bit. Um, now, before we get to this next part, let's see. Does anybody have any questions or or anything? Uh, any any <laughs> any experiences you feel like sharing? Right? Because uh, I'll share with you all plenty of my experiences as as, as sort of anecdotes to maybe uh, make reference to and give advice such as it is and so on. Um, any questions before I go on? Okay. So let's suppose. Oh, I'm sorry, Sheila. You have yeah. I did have one. You you say that that critical thinking doesn't come naturally. So mm -hmm. do you consider it a learned behavior? Can it be taught? Mm -hmm. Yes. In it that can. case, I fault the educational system. Uh, it's a combination of factors. Uh, as somebody who's been a professional educator for over 22 years in some capacity or another. Uh, you are correct, uh, first of all, in saying that the, the, the education system that we have is at least partially at fault. But we always have to understand that the education system does not exist in a vacuum, right? It's, it's, part, of a, it's part of like this broader culture. And so part of it is lack of proper education. Uh, part of it is cultural. Uh, and, 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 and so it, it sometimes is very difficult to separate these things. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that um, we have uh, an education system that, I mean, everybody likes to talk about critical thinking, right? Everybody says, you know, critical thinking is necessary, critical thinking is necessary. Uh, but it's, you know, it's the, it's, it goes back to the old saying, it's, you know, you can talk the talk, but walking the walk is the real, <laughs> that's the real challenge. And that's pretty tough. I see that Susie had raised her hand. Susie, did you have a question? Oh, you're, you're, you have to unmute, Susan. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Good. I, I'm, I'm curious, when you talk about speaking science and advocating, are you talking about being comfortable and advocating for a scientific acceptance, like not saying, uh, I reject everything, I, I believe in a different worldview, or are you talking about really scientific literacy where people are comfortable with the, um, the kinds of things people talk about, the kinds of things scientists do, even engaging hands on themselves? Or do you think this is a false dichotomy? And what will we expect in the presentation going forward? I, I think it's a, uh, this is a really, really, really good question. And I think, uh, I think it's a false dichotomy. I think you can do all of the above. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's not really possible to necessarily separate the two, right? It all, it all, it all ties together. That's and what I'm, what I'm going to do going forward is I'm actually going to give you three specific examples, uh, of, from my own experience and, uh, as to, as to, you know, ways that you can approach uh, this this issue, um, because one of the problems that science has and is that scientists are really good about doing science, right? That's that's why they're doing what they're doing. But a lot of scientists are not good about communicating it, right? Uh, you know, we, like like Dr. Fauci, right? Anthony Fauci, he's the exception. He is amazing about communicating science, and he's also an astonishing scientist. Uh, but a lot of scientists are not like Dr. Fauci, right? Um, and part of that is, quite frankly, part of that's their, you know, going back to the question about education, part of that is how they are educated as scientists. And part of it is also cultural. Uh, and, and so it, it, is, it is kind of tied together. So I hope I addressed your question. <laughs> okay, because uh, sometimes I, I talk a lot and, and then suddenly realize I haven't said anything, but <laughs> something I'm working on too. All right, so any other questions before we, we continue? Okay. All right, so uh, 
okay, I'm sure we've all had this experience at some point, right? You know, you 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 are trying to talk about some scientifically related topic. Uh, you know, just just pick something, uh, and you're talking with somebody who they don't get it, or they're you know they seem like maybe they're they're kind of pushing back against you for whatever reason. Maybe it seems like there's a a political motive or religious motive or or maybe they're just plain ignorant. Um, and in the extreme cases of these kinds of discussions, it's almost as if the facts don't matter, right? You know, you get you can get the quote fake news response or you know scientists are just out to make money or or whatever, right? I mean we we've I think that we've all had some experiences like this. I've had too many experiences like this to count. Some of them have been in my professional experience uh, with students sometimes. Uh, uh, many of them have just been in conversations I've had with people both in person and online and in forums like this as well. Um, so what do you do under these circumstances? Well, again, we go back to, I wanna go back to this point that I made earlier. Um, many times when you're having these kinds of conversations with people, you are in some ways speaking a different language, right? You're saying one thing, but they're hearing something completely different than what you're attempting to communicate to them. And that's because we all have these cognitive filters in our brains, right? And we, we all suffer from this. Uh, if, you've, <laughs> if you've ever, if you're married, and or you've been married for any amount of time and you've ever had an argument with your significant other, uh, you know exactly what I mean because you know you're you're you, you say one thing, they hear another thing, and then suddenly sometimes they can escalate. It's like, oh, okay, it's time for a timeout. We gotta we gotta go our separate corners, right? We've all had this experience. If you've been married, if you've been married for an extended period of time, I've been married for uh, for uh, almost uh, twenty seven years. Uh, you you have those days. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and, but it, it's, a, it, it's often a bigger, a, a, a bigger gap to bridge because of the differing worldviews, especially if you're talking with somebody who is uh, what we might call, quote, anti-science or, or very scientifically ignorant, okay? Um, oops, sorry, let me, there we are. Now, here's the thing. Um, sometimes some people, when they uh, think about, okay, well, what do I do here? The, the, it, you know, it's not that the facts don't matter. The facts totally matter, right? So don't abandon talking about scientific facts. Don't abandon talking about science. Um, the trick, and, and I, I strongly encourage you not to do that because it would make my job really tough as a, as a science teacher. But the, the trick is how do you go about talking about it, right? How, how can you communicate this to them in such a manner that doesn't necessarily immediately put up their uh, cognitive shield, right? And doesn't immediately put up their, their, the wall where they're, where they're trying to, quote, defend themselves against attack, so to speak, okay? Um, and that's the, that's the thing that I've learned over the years in, in, in all of my experiences and so on. And so what I've concluded up to this point in my career and in my personal life and, and all of my interactions with uh, people of all different stripes is that if you wanna be an effective sort of communicator, science citizen scientist, so to speak, you need to kind of expand your own language capabilities. You have to be able to, at some level, try to get into their head a little bit which can be, depending upon who you're talking to, can be a little bit weird. <laughs> okay, I, I will admit it. Um, uh, and you have to be able to speak to them in a language that they're going to understand. Okay, that's the key thing that has that, that really stuck with me. And I'll just do a very quick uh, aside here. One of the reasons why I came to this conclusion is because uh, many years ago, um, almost 10 years ago, in fact, right now, actually, no, 10 years ago, in fact, uh, I decided, you know, I, I've had all of this scientific training, you know, I, I've advanced degrees in physics and mathematics, and, you know, I've taught at the college level and the high school level, I've done all this stuff. It was about 10 years ago when I really, really, really started thinking more deeply about these questions. 
And what I did is I decided to formalize uh, my studies of philosophy. And I went and I got a degree in philosophy. And this really helped me because it helped me. It didn't, I didn't abandon my study of science, but it did help broaden my study of science and how to communicate it more effectively. So this is, you know, this is, uh, I think, a mistake that some scientists will make. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to the question of, you know, how scientists are trained and maybe the culture. Uh, there, there is a little bit of a, of a, of a bias against sort of uh, the humanities and the uh, you know, philosophy and, and similar modes of thinking uh, among some people in the scientific community as you know, maybe it's quote, too fluffy or something like that. Um, but in my formal studies of philosophy, one of the things that really became apparent to me is the rigor of thinking critically and how to go about it. And also the, uh, the study of what's called epistemology or the knowledge of knowledge, right? How do we know what we know? And I think a lot of scientists could really benefit from a basic course in studying epistemology. Uh, it's a, it's very, it's a, it's, it was very useful for me. And I'll speak to that a little bit more later. Now, um, more practically speaking, right? I'll try to draw it down from being in the clouds a little bit. Uh, some advice, right? So suppose you, you're, you're going to do these communications, right? Like, this is going to sound so cliche, uh, but I have to constantly remind myself of this because I am far from infallible on this, right? You have to avoid the, the, the screaming, right? Um, and it's so easy to do, especially if you're trying to engage, say, in an online discussion with somebody who is, quote, trolling you, okay, uh, as, as the saying goes. As the kids these days say, the trolls, don't feed the trolls. Um, and if you, if you, if you, tr if you get into a shouting match, either in person or virtually, uh, it's very difficult to crack through any kind of communication. And the, the thing that I always try to remind myself is whenever I'm engaged in a conversation, nine times out of 10, when you're engaged in this conversation, there's probably somebody else who's paying attention to the conversation. So the conversation is not just between you and your opponent or, or between the, you know, antagonists, whatever. Uh, the conversation is often being observed by a large number of people who are not necessarily actively engaging in the conversation. They're reading it and they're taking it in, but they're not necessarily saying anything. And so I think you always have to kind of remind yourself of that. Um, I've had a numerous experiences, especially with online discussions, where because I've been constantly reminding myself, don't yell or whatever, uh, don't engage in this, uh, I've actually been contacted privately by people who have been reading the conversation who say, you know, I really appreciate the way that you engage in that discussion. And I learned a lot in the process, okay? Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised <laughs> by some of the people who have actually said this to me, who I, in a million years, I would never have thought they would have said something like that, but they did. So, um, and again, this is a cliche, but this is a really important point. I, I, I'm going to steal a line that I heard once from uh, Representative Brad Schneider, um, whom no doubt many of you know. Uh, he, he one time said at some political event I was at, I can't even remember what it was, but he said, said, you know, we have two ears and one mouth and we should use them in proportion. <laughs> and I love that saying. That's a great saying. Um, because if you aren't really paying attention to what the other person is saying, you can very easily misinterpret what they're trying to get at. Now, again, there again, I just want to point out there. There's a broad range here, right? You have people with whom the disagree, with whom you're having a minor disagreement. You have on, on some scientific topic. You have people with whom, you know, they are just completely bonkers, right? They're 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 all the way down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, and the only reason that they're even engaging with you is just to troll you, just to screw with you. Um, and then you have the range in between, okay. So two things I would say. Number one, um, please remind yourself 
whenever you're engaged in these discussions that people can, and sometimes they do, change their minds, okay? And even if it's the person with whom you're arguing against, um, you may not change their mind. They may be completely out to lunch and, and just say, nope, they'll never, you'll never change their mind. But you never know who's paying attention, right? And you might end up changing some other people's minds based on the discussion that you're having. But you can't necessarily do that if you disengage, if you hit that unfriend button. Okay, now again, I'm not saying that uh, anybody should ever put up with any kind of abuse or anything, right? You know, that's, that, that's that those are the two times I unfriended people is because somebody was getting very abusive. And I'm like, okay, done, bye. Um, but uh, sometimes we can be too quick to hit that unfriend button. Just food for thought. All right, now, more advice. <laughs> I'm full of it today. Oh, I'm full of something. Hopefully it's good advice. Um, patience is a key thing. Uh, and again, emphasizing listen, right? Really, really listen. Uh, but in order to in order to speak their language, you have to be able to hear what they're saying. And you have to be able to, in some, time, some cases, you have to be able to interpret what they're saying and read between the lines. And I'll provide some concrete examples in a few moments. Okay. This other thing, this is, this is a real challenge. Um, in order to do the first bullet point, you have to be willing to exit, to exit your own comfort zone to a degree. Um, th and this is one of the reasons why I decided to study philosophy formally, because I realized that in my advocacy of science, I was kind of hitting a wall. I was kind of getting to a point where I, I, I couldn't kind of go past that. And once I started to study a little bit of philosophy and open up my thinking a little bit without abandoning science, uh, I was able to become a better advocate. But I really had to step out of sight of my comfort zone. I mean, as somebody who has a, has a grounding in very solid, rigorous scientific training, to step out of that and go and get a degree in the humanities and philosophy, there's not a lot of people that necessarily feel comfortable doing that. And uh, that was a real challenge for me. Um, so then the question is, how do you insert the science into the discussion so that it's a non in a non-threatening way to the person with whom you're talking, okay? Um, again, don't take the bait, right? Sometimes people will try to bait you and, 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 and get you to insult them, right? Because uh, if they bait you and you can insult them, then they can say, ah, you're just a jerk, right? Um, Boy, it's easy to do. Uh, some people are really good at pushing buttons that way, but it's it's something to try to avoid. Because again, this goes into putting yourself in the person's shoes. Remember, everybody has this identity. Everybody has this worldview. And depending upon how the person with whom you're talking has constructed their worldview, how they've constructed their identity around this worldview, Depending upon, how, depending upon that and how you approach the conversation, it can actually be extraordinarily frightening to them. Uh, you know, if you're talking about somebody who is constructed their worldview around uh, conservative religious beliefs, and you start to uh, pursue a conversation with them that they perceive is in any way threatening to those beliefs, it's frightening. It's absolutely frightening to them. And just for example, uh, think about how you would feel if you were having a conversation with somebody who uh, was saying, you know, there should be no such thing as secularism, right? Uh, we should be a theocracy. And, you know, they go through all this list of things. I would, I would submit that that would be an extraordinarily uncomfortable conversation for uh, uh, us all myself included, to engage in. Uh, but I actually have had conversations with people like that. Uh, we Actually, some of those conversations were when I was uh, working through my philosophy degree, because part of that is you purposefully engage in those discussions to kind of cut your argument in of teeth, so to speak. Uh, so it's, uh, if, if, if that kind of a conversation is uncomfortable for somebody like me, then it has to be uncomfortable if the tables are turned and it's going the other way in the perception of this other person. Okay. And this last point is also really important. Don't expect miracles. 
don't expect that the person with whom you're talking is suddenly going to, you know, be, you know, uh, suddenly turn into this big science booster overnight uh, that they're going to turn into the next, you know, Bill Nye or whatever. Um, the, the goal that I have always pursued in these regards is to try just to plant a little seed of doubt and give it room to grow. Because sometimes these conversations take a very long time. Sometimes they take years, and I'll and I'm going to share with you a couple of experiences that uh, that corroborate this that I've had. Uh, and again, if you're engaging in these conversations with somebody, especially if they're close to you, a family member, uh, you know, uh, somebody, you know, at work, whatever. If you're engaging in these conversations, uh, sometimes they they do take a very long time, and because they take a very long time, again, that that is that that emphasizes the importance of not, of not cutting off communication prematurely. Okay. Um, now, before we get to this next part, and this is where it's going to get a bit more interactive. Okay. Because as a, as a teacher, uh, I've done my lecturing part. Okay. We're going to start getting more interactive here in a moment. Uh, so in a few moments, I'm going to ask people to unmute, but before we do any of that, uh, does anybody have any other questions or, or, or thoughts they want to share before we proceed? Because now it's going to start to get kind of fun. Matt, can I ask a quick question? This is Adam here. Sure. sure. So I'm interested in the intersection between philosophy and science on the question of you have your truth and I have my truth. You know, so on one level, we want people to be able to make up their own minds, right? Mm -hmm. We support freedom of opinion and freedom of belief. Um, and yet sometimes we're dealing with what we consider fact-based issues. Yes. Like, did this happen or not? And what is the mechanism for this uh, taking place? And what are the risks, risks if we don't change our behavior and mm -hmm. environmental issues and so on? Um, and what, what we find is this sort of tension between the postmodern, everybody has their own truth and can mm -hmm. understand the world in their own way, which we would support on a philosophical level. Mm -hmm. And then the scientific push to say there is a truth that is non-negotiable. You can't have your own facts and all those kind of uh, approaches. So I'm curious for your thoughts on the intersection of those two intellectual trends and how you how you harmonize both of those. Um, the way that I like to think of it is that Now, personally, I'll just, I'll give you my personal thoughts uh, first. Personally, I, I am uh, what you would call a philosophical naturalist. That's my particular bent on philosophy. Um, and that is somebody who states that um, this physical world that is around us is all that there is. Um, and we... Uh, you know, we can speculate about some metaphysical or mystical realm, but uh, we don't have any evidence that such a thing exists and so on and so forth. And, and so because of that, uh, naturally, I am also an atheist and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's a key distinction here. There is a distinction between philosophical naturalism, which is what I just expressed to you, and what's called methodological naturalism. Okay. And methodological naturalism is the toolkit, so to speak, by which science is done. And what methodological naturalism done is it does is it says that uh, I'm going to remain neutral, so to speak, on the topic of some metaphysical or mystical realm or the existence of a God or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to remain neutral on those questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal uh, only with the things that I can deal with, which is the physical world, the things that I can measure and observe and so on and so forth, right? That is a key distinction that must be made. And I have found that, especially when I'm dealing with people in my conversations, uh, like with creationists, for example, uh, especially in those particular conversations, I am very clear to make that distinction with people because in many cases, I won't say all cases, there's not, never 100%, but in many cases, that actually sets some people at ease. And this is a really interesting point because one of the examples that I'm going to talk about is dealing with creationists, okay? Because there are people who have, they feel 
that if you are advocating for science, then you must necessarily be advocating against their religious worldview. Great, that's and very making, helpful. Yeah, and making that distinction between philosophical naturalism, which again, personally, I share, that is, that is, my, that is part of my worldview. Mm -hmm. But the method of science, the toolkit of science, methodological naturalism, that is a key distinction that I think should be made. Okay. The other thing that I will say is this, uh, and this is, this is sort of the bumper sticker response. Science is objective, it's not neutral. When it comes to those physical questions. Okay, so that's sort of my bumper sticker response as opposed to my long, very wordy response. Okay, so does that make sense? Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, Sheila, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, and I, all of this, what, what you're saying is is absolutely the way to go. But I have found in, in some of particularly online conversations that I have not participated in, but as you say, I have read. And sometimes what happens is I get the impression that there's a, even though both are typing English, there's a language barrier. Oh, definitely. Because they can't <laughs> even agree on what the words mean. Mm -hmm. And right. so, do you, do you ever get into that kind of conversation where you ask, well, you know, what does, what does the word theory mean to you? It's not just somebody's opinion. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> All the time, yes. Um, and again, this is where talking, trying to really understand what they're saying, right? Because I love the example that you just made. They say theory means this. And you're thinking theory means something else. The first step in that conversation is, okay, let's have a common understanding of what we're talking about. I mean, if you are engaging with somebody who's legitimately asking you a, a question in good faith, which, you know, even if you're disagreeing with them, maybe they are. I mean, I honestly, like, go back to my example of creationists, and, uh, as, as, as Rabbi Adam knows, I've, I've had plenty of uh, arguments with creationists. Um, Often that is one of the key challenges is, is you know, they're saying one thing, they're, they're, they're using this word and I'm using this word, but okay, now can we, let's come to some agreement on what the word we're talking about. Um, like, I, I remember I had this exchange many times with this uh, creationist uh, with whom I had a conversation, ongoing conversation for years. And it took us quite a bit of time just to come into a common agreement of what the word God meant. It's like they say, "Well, we're talking about God." So, and my my question for them was, "What do you mean by God? You know, what are you? What do you mean when you say God?" Right? And and once we were able to pin that down, then we were able to continue the conversation in a more constructive manner. But that took a lot of time, and that right there actually gets to something that I'll be referring to later, uh, which is uh, you know was at the core of my philosophical training. <laughs> But, okay, uh, but th th we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, anybody have any other questions before we proceed? Because I want to give you three concrete examples here uh, to, to ponder. And this is where we're going to get a little interactive. Okay. All right, Susie, do you have your hand up? Oh, okay. Okay. I saw a little icon and I didn't know. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to show you three pictures and I want you to take a few seconds to think about what they're saying. Okay. Here we go. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. And uh, perhaps most, uh, re uh, most relevant for our current time, here's the third one. And we're gonna take each of these in turn, okay? We're gonna start with the uh, global warming one, okay? Global warming denial. Now, here's my first question for you, and this is where you can feel free to unmute and chime in with your two cents worth, okay? What is he protesting? I think he's, I think pro he's talking he's about the science at all. Okay, uh, Roger, you were, uh, did you want to say something? Roger, I've been having this exact conversation with, with somebody I've known for for a, a number of years about global warming. And the, the, um, his, his denial of global warming probably is, is more based on, on what 
the environmentalists suggest we do to solve the problem than, than recognizing the problem. Um, they, they'll recognize the problem and say, well, it's just a, just a, 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 a historical cycle. But, but the worst thing is trying to, to even get, get facts. They will come up with the one or two outlier scientific studies or the one or two articles where there was an environmentalist study that, that had a poor methodology and use those examples to try and refute the other 99% of, of, of the scientific community. And when you start citing sources, um, they won't accept, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, Scientific American. Um, you talk about fact checkers and they'll say, well, Snopes was funded by George Soros, so we won't accept your, your fact checking. And the bottom line is, it's almost impossible to get to a, a basic set of facts in which to even begin to discuss the situation. Okay, I saw that, uh, Lori, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, so the, the, this is a, okay, so full disclosure, I have a PhD in history. <laughs> so that's more my coming from my philosophical ideas. Um, this man is not talking about facts. This has nothing to do with facts. This has to do with the conclusion that he believes that is a nexus of ideas in which he, this is just part of what he believes. And the fact that he's, he's not going to discuss these other things to you because he doesn't care about your facts. What he has found is two or three things that justify what he says. It's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, so we've had the discussion about the Torah. All right. So the, the fundamentalist uh, Christian goes back and says, but in, in Genesis 27, 33, sorry, Adam, I don't have the numbers down, right? But, you know, <laughs> it says that, you know, uh, we can't have, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, X, Y, and Z. I said, well, but what about the, the other 13 laws that are on that same, you know, area that you're totally ignoring? You know, like we can't wear two types of linen, you know, we can't wear two types of material, or we can't see two, you know, can't have a farm field with two different crops. And well, that's not relevant. You know, what's relevant is that, is that homosexuality is, is against the, you know, against the Bible. Well, again, there, there's kind of no point. I mean, it's not a question of facts. You, you can throw every, Raj, you can throw every fact you want at this guy. And he's never going to agree with you. It doesn't matter, you know, because it's his belief system. So he's arguing from the top down and you're trying to argue from the bottom up because you're thinking in a way of creating an argument. Here's the facts. Here's what argument emanates from that. He says, this is my, this is my belief and I'm going to find what justifies that, which is the difference between what I call history and propaganda. He's, he's, he's shouting propaganda. He's not looking for history. Does that make sense? Uh, Adam, you wanted to chime in? Yeah. So there's a nice distinction that I read about in um, the book, The Righteous Mind by um, Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, which is about how different political thinkers do moral reasoning. Um, and it, it really offers some interesting insights into how we make decisions and how we think. Um, and one of the, the discussions he has is the difference between can I believe it and must I believe it? So if it's a fact that reinforces what we already think or our values or our identity, like you were talking about, then we ask, can I believe it? Is there the smallest shred of evidence that we can latch onto and say, okay, I'm justified in who I am and what I think. The flip side is if it's something that undermines your sense of identity, uh, tribalism or core belief, you say, must I believe it? Is there any way I can discredit this fact so that I can ignore it because I'm gonna to have to force myself to believe it and it's gonna make me change all kinds of other things. So I found that distinction between can I believe it to support what we think and must I believe it if it undermines what we think to be really insightful. Yeah, we're, we are very good at doing that. <laughs> right. and, that and that goes right back to what we were what I was saying in the very beginning about the world here. Uh, now, uh, and I love the conversation that has that has come up here because there's been so much that has come out in just the last you know five or six minutes here. Um, here's what I would submit to you, and and somebody I think it was Sheila, I think you said it. Uh, I would submit to you that this man is not necessarily arguing against the science of global warming. I would argue that what he's what his primary concern is 
socialism, what he calls, quote, socialism. That is his primary concern. Uh, and, and again, I think it was Sheila that mentioned, you know, or, or, or I can't remember, somebody mentioned it. Uh, you know, he has this concern, he has this fear that if global warming is acknowledged to be the real thing, then the hippie socialist environmentalists are going to come in and then they're going to start doing un-American bad things that are in direct, that he considers to be in direct conflict with his worldview, yes. right? Okay, so everybody see what I'm getting at here? So here's the, here's the thing, and this is where I'll start sharing some personal anecdotes. I have a, a friend and a colleague with whom I work. Uh, I've known him for 20 years. He is a great guy. Um, whenever I can, I have him over to the house. Uh, we, 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 uh, you know, we shoot the bull and we, uh, you know, we hang out, we have beers together and so on. Politically speaking, we're almost on opposite ends of the spectrum. He is very conservative, uh, politically. I am, I won't say very liberal, but I'm definitely left to center in my politics. And we have, that we have over the years discussed global warming. And what I found with him uh, is in having these, uh, these long-term respectful conversations is I found exactly this. I found that his real concerns about this particular topic is not global warming itself. His real concerns are the potential political ramifications of global warming in terms of how the problem is addressed. And so what I did is once I understood what his real concern was, I started to do a little bit more digging and I started to look at, you know, okay, if this is the real thing and if it's a problem, then what are the possible ways to address it? And what I was able to do is, again, through very respectful, long-term conversations. This, these are conversations that took place over like a 10 year period with this guy, okay? Um, what I did is I was able to present to him and say, okay, there are three issues. Number one, is it occurring? Number two, are humans a factor or a major factor in, in the process? And number three, what do we do about it? And again, it was number three, that was his primary sticking point, but because he was stuck on that point, and he was looking at it from a political standpoint, it made him go backwards and kind of cast doubt on the other two. But once I was able to get him to think about the third point a little more broadly, what I did is I presented to him, I said, okay, there are the, what you might call, quote, liberal solutions to global warming, carbon tax, you know, laws against uh, fracking or drilling for oil in the in the Arctic or you know, whatever you want to, whatever, right? There's this whole slew of maybe more what you might call, quote, left-wing solutions. Um, I was able to, to do some digging and I found some conservative, more conservative solutions. And I started to present some of those to him. I said, well, what about these? These are, these are solutions that are coming from a more conservative uh, viewpoint. Uh, and he started to kind of think about it a little bit. And in and, and one day, I'll, I'll never forget, we were actually in the parking lot at work after school one day. And it was like this bolt from the blue. He just came right out and he admitted to me. He goes, you know, I really appreciate us having these conversations because uh, it, it's really gotten me to understand that my objection really is political. And uh, he says, I think these ideas are absolutely terrible, but I believe that these might be tenable. And I'm willing to go so far as to admit to you that, yeah, I think humans have contributed to global warming. Huzzah, some degree of success. Now, is he going to endorse the carbon tax tomorrow? Hell no, <laughs> he'll probably <laughs> never do that. Okay, but has he been able to get to a point where he at least acknowledges that number one, global warming is real and number two, humans do contribute to it? Yeah, he has made a lot of progress on those. So it's possible, it's doable. Not with everyone, not all the time, but it can happen. But I couldn't make that progress with him 
until I could get him to stop talking about Al Gore. He, that was his go-to. He would always talk about Al Gore because, you know, Al Gore is the, the hippie guy and you can latch onto that and then dismiss everything. Once, mm-hmm. I, once I was able to steal the, steer the conversation away from Al Gore, I basically stopped talking about Al Gore. I never mentioned anything about Al Gore. And, ever, and if he ever brought it up, I'd say, I don't want to talk about Al Gore. I don't care about Al Gore. Let's talk about this other thing. I was able to kind of steer it in this different direction. And once I was able to do that, and, 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 and maybe more separate the science from the politics, then he felt more comfortable and he was more open to having a, a, more, uh, a more constructive discussion. So but it took a long time and it took a hell of a lot of patience on my part. <laughs> oh my gosh, it took so much patience on my part. Um, oh, do we have some people uh, posting in the chat here? I thought I saw something. Oh, I can't access the chat. Where's the little button for, the- oh, there it is. Oh, yes, let's see if it's something. Oh. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody brought up a yeah. Uh, somebody brought up a great point. The situation with masks. As as soon as it became a political problem or a political statement, that's where everything went off the rails, right? That was that that, that yeah. That's that's exactly the same thing. Right? It was exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how to talk about the mask thing. <laughs> I'm working on that. Yeah, but I'm glad somebody brought up that point. Okay, so is everybody ready to go to example number two? Here we go. Let's go to the second one. Oops, shoot. I got to click back on this thing. Here we go. Okay, creationism, right? Uh, This is my personal, quote, favorite. Um, Look at the graphic. What do you think is the primary concern expressed here? The people who made this, what are they really saying, do you think? They're talking about you've taken religion out of it completely, particularly our view, which is Christianity. Okay. Any other thoughts? I think there's a morality claim here as well. I mean, you notice that the the person is burdened by sin, and it actually make in 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 their version of what really happens, um, it will overwhelm you and crush you. Uh, if you don't see their version of the truth and have that sort of purification process coming out of it. Um, but, and, and the other one is, you know, you'll be out there walking, but you're still burdened by sin and uh, there's only one way out of that. Um, yeah. So that's, it's a moral claim too. Yeah. It, also, it also looks like that the only true evolution, you can only be evolved if you find their religion. Um, okay. What we say is evolution is, is is false, but to be truly evolved, you have to find their religion. And not just any religion. Right. Any any other thoughts? Anybody else want to chime in? Before I proceed and give you my thoughts. Well, and my, my thought would simply be that um, for them, evolution, um, as we see it, scientific evolution is, is simply a challenge to their entire worldview. Which, which is that they're that God and religion and whatever religion they are, it doesn't, you could substitute a lot of things for that and it would be, it could still be the same c- cartoon, but it could be Islam or whatever. We're not um, even talking about evolution here. Um, it, it, it's just, right. a, it's really a challenge to their whole worldview. And so therefore they have to denigrate it totally. And uh, I'm sorry, who was just uh, speaking about, uh, we're not even talking about evolution. Who was it was saying that? Mm. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Yes, that's that's exactly what I wanted to say. We're not even really talking about the um, term evolution here. Yeah, and that's and I think and I agree. Um, first of all, I'll say that I, I I think it's interesting. You notice how they're actually trying to co-opt the word evolution. This is a this was a really interesting twist that I, I one time saw with creationists they for a long time they would deny the word evolution but now they're actually in this particular case they're actually trying to co-opt it right there's the false evolution but we have the true evolution i don't know in in some weird way i consider that a small victory uh but (laughs) but um it is it is kind of an interesting rewording of what the what they're saying and I think a lot. I think a lot of you kind of hit on it. This isn't necessarily uh, about evolution. This is about these people perceive 
this what they're calling false evolution but evolutionary biology you know whatever and anything that's associated they perceive this as a threat to their worldview right and the and there's this false dichotomy presented there's their particular religious belief on the one hand and then there is this evolution on the other hand and they necessarily have to conflict right now <clears throat> Here is where I'm going to give you my second anecdote. I have actually a family member um, who I have had conversations with on this particular topic for many, many, many years. And uh, my family member is, uh, or I don't know if he is still, but at least at one point he was definitely what we might call a young earth creationist. This is um, a branch of what they claim to be biblical literalism or the way they read Genesis uh, is that, uh, you know, the earth is 6,000 years old and so on and so forth. Um, and this is what many people think of when they think of creationism. But one day we, as we were having our conversations, I asked him this question. I said, well, is there only one kind of creationism? And he paused and he thought, well, what are you talking about? And based upon his reaction, I could tell that this is a question he had never thought of before. And notice what I'm talking about. Notice what, more specifically, notice what I'm not talking about in the way I'm asking this question. What am I not talking about here? In kind of an interesting way. I'm actually not talking about scientific facts right? I'm not talking about carbon dating. I'm not talking about the fossil record. I'm not talking about mitochondrial DNA. I'm not talking about these things. Because what I discovered is in my many, many conversations with this person, uh, anytime I would present a scientific fact, they would simply ignore it or dismiss it. And this, again, goes right back to the conversation we had with the previous example, okay? So what I figured is that what I had to do is I had to start talking in his language. And so I said, well, I'm not gonna abandon science entirely, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change how I approach the question. And so I asked him, I said, well, is there only one kind of creation? Because he goes, what are you talking about? And then I said, and then, you know, again, the conversation progressed and eventually I got to the point where I asked him, I said, well, you consider God to be all powerful, yes? Yes. I said, well, and God can do whatever he wants, right? Because to this person, God was a he, right? So I, I kind of put myself in that language mode. And, uh, and they said, yes. I said, well, why couldn't God have created through the process of evolution? And again, this is going back to the question that Rabbi Adam, I think, was asking earlier, right? Um, where I, as a philosophical naturalist, as an atheist, right? I'm not even trying to argue with your religion is false and all this stuff. I'm, just, I'm, I'm completely separating that from methodological naturalism. Right. So, you know, kind of remaining agnostic on the question of the metaphysical out there and saying, okay, well, for the sake of this conversation, let's assume that God exists. And let's assume that God's all powerful. Let's assume that God wants to, you know, can do whatever he wants. Why couldn't he have done this? Why couldn't he have created through this process called evolution? Uh, and, and in fact, that's actually kind of a variation of an argument that goes all the way back to St. Augustine. Um, but he paused <laughs> and I could see the wheels turning and I decided to let them turn for a while. And then the next time we started having our conversations and talking about this, you know, we kind of picked up from that point. And what he did is he had a rebuttal for me, which is perfectly fine. And his rebuttal was, well, it's outlined as it says in the Bible. And his go-to was, the Bible is literally true, and I'm sure some of you have talked to people a bit like the, you know, who, who share this view. The Bible is literally true, and uh, you know, it, it, it's all as it's outlined there in the Bible, and, and so on and so forth. And it says this in Genesis, and you know, you can you know, go through and infer the rest yourself. Six thousand years, yada yada. It's like okay, and again, not talking about carbon dating, not talking about the Big Bang, not abandoning those ideas either. You know, because notice I kind of got the little in there. Why couldn't God have done it through evolution, right? So haven't abandoned it. I'm just 
talking about it a little different. And then what I just say, okay, so now we're talking about the, now we're, so now we're not talking about God's power anymore. We're talking about the interpretation of the Bible. So let's talk about the Bible. And so what I did is I asked him about Isaiah 40, 22. And uh, does anybody know what I'm getting at here? Now, honestly, I cannot remember if this is Old Testament or New Testament. So if it's New Testament, I apologize because, of course, you know, uh, the, the, I believe the Torah is Old Testament. But what Isaiah 40, 22 basically says is, uh, if, if you look it up, uh, it basically talks about the it talks about the structure of the earth. And uh, they, like the earth is the, like the floor of a tent and the sky is a dome that goes over it and so on. And so the inference is, if you read this literally, then the earth is flat. And so I asked my relative, I said, do you believe the earth is flat? And he said, well, no, it's obviously not flat. I said, well, why not? Why, why don't you believe the earth is flat? And so, you know, he started going through some of the reasons, you know, you can look far away and you can see on, you know, on a ship that's out in the ocean, right? The mast is the last thing you see when it's sailing away, you know, these kinds of things. And I was like, okay, okay. So let me ask you this. You're not reading Isaiah 40, 22, literally. pause <laughs> he started to pause and he's like uh i said well you you say that you are a biblical literalist and if you do read this passage in the bible literally then you must necessarily accept a flat earth and we went round and round on some terminology for a while and then we kind of came to an agreement on on, on that uh he's like yeah well no you can't read isaiah 40 22 that way so well, what do you mean and he says well you have to read isaiah 40 22 poetically it's like a metaphor and at that moment, I looked at him and I said, oh, you mean how some people read Genesis metaphorically? And then there was an extremely long pause in the conversation for about a month. <laughs> uh, but the seed of doubt had been planted. And now he doesn't necessarily, he's not necessarily so quick to dismiss the science of evolution. So... Uh, and he and I still have some very interesting conversations on occasion. Again, I'm not going to say that he's going to turn into Francis Collins overnight, for example, or definitely not Richard Dawkins, but uh, he is not, he, he's not so quick to dismiss it like he used to be. Uh, so, you know, for what it's worth. Uh, anybody have any questions or anything before we go to our third example? Just wanted to keep an eye on the time. Uh, it's about 4.15, so we should aim to be done probably around 4.30. Yeah, we'll be done. We'll be done by then. We're, once Great. we get past this third one, we're, we're almost at the end. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So uh, third example and probably the most contemporary one. Oops. I got to make sure I'm clicked on my presentation. Ooh, talk about relevance. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So... What message is being sent? How do you interpret this graphic? What do you think it's saying? Uh, you've got the poison, the skull and crossbones. You've got a distressed baby who's stuck full of plungers and needles and hypodermics. So it's definitely an anti-vax. Why? Why are we injecting all this poison into these poor, defenseless, yet protesting babies? Sort of no backstory on why we would take this kind of measure. There's no balance. There's no look at cost-benefit analysis. And there's a great assumption that this is poison, which has an association with detriment rather than benefit building into a lot of assumptions and abhorrences. And who, who do you all think this message is targeted towards? Parents. Sorry, say it again. Parents. Parents, yeah. Because what parent would not react negatively to a distressed child? Especially if it's their own child. Okay. Parents of an adult whose kids have been through it and have thrived. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe what should be done is the message. The, the the answer should be refined. This is targeted towards new parents. Well, 
I also think, if I may say so, I think the story distinctly targeted towards white parents. Um, and, and I think this is, there's a very specific racial message here as well, um, quite frankly. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so this is a, a common tactic among anti-vaccinationists to, I actually grabbed this off of one of their websites. Um, mm -hmm. And so the question is, suppose you're talking to somebody who is what I like to call vaccine hesitant, right? Because there's, there's this, this, this is some terminology that I think is very good that has come out in the last few months is, you know, you have people who are vehemently anti-vaccine. Uh, those are the folks who I say they're all the way down the rabbit hole and you'll never reach them necessarily. <laughs> but then there's that audience, that broad audience in the middle who is vaccine hesitant. Okay. They're not necessarily ideologically opposed to the idea of vaccines, but uh, there's just something icky about them, right? It doesn't necessarily sit well, especially if it's a brand new vaccine developed using new technology that hasn't necessarily been tested in the population yet in their mind and so on and so forth, right? Such as the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, okay? Which actually have been tested in the population and so on. But, you know, again, trying to put yourself in the mode of the other person's thinking, okay? So um, how do you respond to this? Now, uh, what I'll do is, again, share my own anecdote on this. Um, this anecdote has the advantage of really being uh, grounded in some solid scientific research because uh, many years ago, like actually uh, about 10, 12 years ago, about 10, 11 years ago, I was involved with an organization, two organizations, in fact, the, uh, the, the Women Thinking uh, uh, Foundation and the uh, James Randi Educational Foundation. And we, uh, we joint, those two organizations jointly worked on research on this exact question. How do you respond to a message like this to help people get past vaccine hesitancy and vaccinate themselves or their kids or both. And what we were able to do is we were able to take this exact same message and turn it around, right? Because the, what's the concern here? The concern is the well being of the child. This is the primary message that's being expressed here. And so what we were able to do is we were able to come up with uh, ways of messaging this against this particular form of propaganda to say, well, look, if your primary concern is about protecting your child, oh, and again, I have to give a shout out to the WT Inc. and the JRF for this. Um, you know, if, if your primary objective here is to protect the child, well, you know, nothing protects them 100%, nothing does. But would you put your child in a car without putting them into a car seat? And vast majority of the parents that we, well, you know, uh, interviewed and, and, and collected data on, we've conducted a lot of interviews and surveys, uh, is uh, they said, well, of course you would put your kid in a child seat. Well, why would you do that? Even though it's not 100% effective, they said, well, you play the odds, right? You know, 90, 90 95% protection is better than, than zero or, you know, 50% protection even is better than zero. Uh, and these were the kinds of responses we would get from parents. And then what we were able to do is we were able to uh, message pro-vaccine arguments in a very similar manner. It's like, yeah, the vaccine's not 100%, but it's way better than nothing. It's you know better than 50%, so why not do it? And that, and that kind of counter-argument, using the same message, you, the, the core argument here is you want to protect children, right? That actually resonated with a lot of parents. And again... You, again, you have to ask, well, what's the concern being expressed, right? What is, what, is, what is the message? What is the concern? And can you then talk about it in a language that they can understand? Uh, Roger, you got your hand up. Yeah, um, that works when you're talking about the traditional anti-vax positions. The mm -hmm. current one, though, is, is much more political, just like masks. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it's again based upon your news sources. If your news sources are conspiracy, where Bill Gates is putting chips in your microchips in your vaccine, or your other nutty news source where uh, COVID is just like the flu, you don't need one. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, 47%, I think with 47% of Republican men are refusing 
to take the vaccine. And so there is, it's, it's based uh, so much more political and that's a little, a lot more insidious to fight. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up. So let me speak to that. Uh, and again, I'll provide some, uh, some data and also provide some anecdote. Um, the good news is the hesitancy that has been expressed among Republicans, as you outlined, is actually on the decline. Um, but part of that is political, which I'll get to in a moment, but part of that is also sort of the broader feeling among more people in the population. If you think back, think back to December when the vaccines first came out about the number of people that you talk to either on the phone or online or whatever, uh, who were expressing concern, hesitancy, skepticism of these brand new technologies and so on and so forth. There were a ton of people that I know who were expressing this from all across the political and ideological spectrum, okay? Even many people who I would consider like me were expressing these concerns. And my reaction was, okay, uh, I wasn't, I didn't judge them. We, I, I didn't, you know, we didn't belittle them, you know, and say, oh, if you don't get your vaccine, then you're a bad person because you're contributing to other people potentially getting sick. No, no. What I did is said, well, I understand your concerns. It is new technology uh, and it might, and it, and, it may, and it does sound a little bit scary, but let's talk about how these things actually work, right? And so there, I would present some people with some of the science of well, how mRNA works and, and so on and so forth. I would, um, uh, I, I would say, you know, and by the way, some of these people that I'm talking about, they were healthcare workers, like they, they were nurses. There was even one doctor, right? Um, which again, you're like, whoa, but that was, that was what it was. And, you know, I would have these conversations and people I know would have these conversations. And I say, look, I said, but you know, the real, the real test as to whether or not people are going to feel comfortable with this is after the first round of people, the first round of healthcare workers in December and January get vaccinated, you're going to see that they're not growing a third arm or, you know, their, their legs not falling off or whatever. Uh, and you're going to see that they're fine. And I said, that's going to be the biggest thing to watch for. And I, and, and I kept telling people, I say, as you see more and more people get the vaccine and they're okay, and then they start talking about, yeah, I felt kind of crummy for a day after I got up and now I feel great. And I feel so much more comfortable and at ease. And again, you're not necessarily making, this is not necessarily a sign. Uh, I mean, it's an argument that's based in science, but, you're, but what's actually being done here is there's an emotional message being sent. Okay? And just like with this anti-vaccination picture here, it's an emotional message that's being sent. And I argued, uh, and, and I think that, I've been right about this, fortunately, that as more and more people get vaccinated and start talking to their friends and their family, you're gonna see the level of vaccine hesitancy come down. And I'm very happy to say, at least this, and this is sort of anecdotally, that of the people that I knew from different political, spec, uh, different political stripes, um, most of the people that I know who were expressing their hesitancy to get the vaccine two, three months ago have now, said, well, I still have some concerns, but they're kind of doing this internal cost-benefit analysis. They say, I still have some concerns, but now I'm leaning towards getting it, or I've already got it. And there is this Facebook group that I'm a member of where recently I get into these arguments sometimes with this person who's extremely right-wing. And she actually said, just last week, I got my first shot. And my first response to her wasn't, ha I told you so, or anything like that. My first response to her was, how are you feeling? Are, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, I was kind of down for a day, but it's okay. And she says, you know, she says, and she actually complimented me. She said, you know, you've got a really good way of approaching this because you're not trying to push me to get it. You're letting me make the decision on my own. And I said, yeah, and that's what needs to be done. And she was very accepting. And then she started telling her friends, you guys should get the shot. Now, has everybody been convinced? No, <laughs> obviously not. Do more people need to be convinced? Yes, they do but it's progress. And, you know, as somebody who's been a teacher for over 22 years, I, I take progress where I can get it. <laughs> so there we go. Um, let me just make a couple more quick comments and then uh, we'll, I guess, do any final questions that we have. This is, a, I, this is my obligatory slide where I give a shout out to philosophy. 
This is one of my favorite philosophers, Socrates. This is a this is the the image of the death of Socrates right before he's about to drink the hemlock. Um, but this isn't why I like it. It's not that he's going to die. It's because my one of my favorite methods of talking to people uh, is what's called the Socratic method, the Socratic dialogue, where you ask them questions and you and they engage in this question and answer with you and. In my opinion, the Socratic method is one of the greatest tools that you have to engage in these kinds of discussions. Um, it's, uh, and for somebody who's kind of a philosophy geek like me, it's also pretty fun. <laughs> so I would, I, so I always like to give a shout out to the Socratic method. And the last thing I wanna say before we just have any final questions or comments is um, I think in many ways, we also have to remind people of one more thing. And that's kind of embodying this picture right here. <laughs> And this is where I always like to try to end talks like this on a very positive note. Again, this is kind of an emotional, uh, an emotional argument because we are emotional creatures. Um, there's just something really cool and awesome about science, what it allows us to do, what, what sort of understanding it gives us of the universe. Um, we have so many interesting things around us now that are as a result of the scientific method and the, and the, and the technologies that come out of science. I mean, you hear all this stuff about the, 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 the revolution that's now taking place in uh, electric vehicle technology. I've even got some right-wing friends who are like chomping at the bit to get their first electric vehicle now because, you know, it, it's cool. Not necessarily because they want to fight global warming, but they just want to have a cool car, right? <laughs> it's like, well, it's a cool car. Um, you know, and then we just recently put a put a, uh, a rover, this really, this SUV sized rover called Perseverance on another world, on Mars. And it's streaming back pictures and video all the time now. And again, you know, in an emotional sense, there are people who are gonna love this just because they, you know, intrinsically like science, but then there are gonna be people who love it because, you know, we did it, the USA did it. Maybe that's how they look at things. Maybe that's part of their identity. They say, yeah, USA but science helped us do this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, science is cool. And then again, to bring it back to the thing that's on everybody's mind right now, we wouldn't be getting out of this mess right now that we're in, this, this pandemic that has hit everybody, you know, right of center, left of center, middle of the road, religious, non-religious, black, white, brown, whatever, you know, it's hit all of us. Uh, we wouldn't be getting out of it if it weren't for what we've got through the scientific process. And so, and, and, and to, to Roger's point, I think there are a lot of people who, you know, even though they may approach things from, uh, you know, the, the, from a, a slightly conspiratorial standpoint, like my, uh, like the person I know in this right-wing chat room, uh, she's come around and now she's talking to other people about it. She's not gonna vote for Biden ever, <laughs> but, <laughs> but at least she went out and she got her shot. And you know, that's a win. <laughs>